Replacing Growth with Belonging Economies, a Neo-Peasant Response, by Patrick Jones and Meg Ullman. When we put our hands on the soil before a meal, and speak into the living of the world, acknowledging that all our fuel, food, shelter, drink, clothes, tools, and much more besides, come from a truly giving earth, we begin to tell another story of economy, another story of culture. It is this return to an animist honouring, this fessing up with gratitude to what our lives are actually indebted to and upon what our lives stand, that enables our senses to merge into a deeper belonging with the communities of life much more than human that make more life possible. We weren't always so conscious of what supports us and makes more life. Our industrial schooling and early enculturation into white modernity had little consideration or acknowledgement of world being larger than human. There were no ceremonies or festivals that honoured non-human life that we were a part of. Our enculturation was hyper-techno-civil, an extreme human-centric urbanism. Yet our ancestors held ceremonies and rituals to celebrate the giving of life, the transitions of the seasons and the sun, and various rites of passage. Our advancement of neo-peasantry is a reclaiming of ancestral honouring, which we will come to better explain. This chapter is an unpacking of our path from hyper techno civility from resource and world intransigence, into the relational realm of resource and world honouring, of the labourings and makings of what we call neo-peasantry. It is the story of our family's step-by-step -step embrace of the ethics and politics of degrowth, made possible by our current practice of permaculture principles and our own way of neo-peasant culturing. It is also the story of our household's merge into community sufficiency and how growing both the informal subsistence economies of home place with numerous others has enabled a 70% degrowth of the formal economy. In other words, we are only 30% reliant on the global monetary economy. We have found that by growing, foraging, fishing, hunting and gleaning our food, we have been able to transform both our economic and cultural lifeways. Realising the limits, what is to be done? In recent times, the left has shied away from personal accountability. It's become politically more expedient to point the finger at big business than to encourage a culture that takes responsibility for its actions and divest from such power. For subjects of capital, taking personal responsibility for how we live has been in decline for decades as governments have regulated social life to such an extent that personal accountability has become increasingly difficult. As a result, nanny state paternalism has flourished in the rich countries where life is approached as something to control and to construct certainty. This attempt to establish assurance the idea, for example, that a food product like Vegemite will always be there to purchase as long as you go to work to raise the money to afford it, constructs the illusion that industrial food systems are permanent and the world can keep offering itself up to maintain such an ideology. Under the order of industrial food systems, the whole world is in a form of bondage, determined by an ever greater panic to meet growing demands. Yet for most of human existence, societies have presented an entirely different cosmology for life-making based upon a fluctuating engagement with seasonal and biome variation. Therefore, life-making is dependent on relationships with that which makes more life possible. And thus, when it comes to provisioning food, relationships are foregrounded and technology backgrounded. In our own story, of addressing paternalistic and unwitting participation in the global marketplace, we had become acutely conscious of limits to growth. We read reports, we studied graphs, charts and statistics, 
We watched documentaries and TED Talks and downloaded innumerable podcasts. We cross-referenced thousands of voices from indigenous speakers, climate scientists, ecological philosophers and cultural commentators. We recognize that within our historical privilege, we have a greater responsibility to act, which included reducing our privilege in the formal economy because of its direct impact on the interrelated complex of climate, species, social and ecological crises. We became increasingly aware of the logic and imperatives of degrowth as an essential economic, ecologic and social strategy. Degrowth is a much needed and overdue response to the limits of growth report and to overconsumption of the world's resources through an entrenched cultural acrasia. But we didn't know what monetary degrowth looked like up close. How do you live it? What does a degrowth lunch look like? How do you bring up your children to embrace degrowth in a world of endless choices and celebrated consumptive behaviours? Is it possible to find joy in degrowth? How do we begin our journey of degrowth when the very terms sound so grim and austere? It would be ideal if global monetary degrowth and localised economic growth were implemented as planned strategies augmented at all levels of government and society. But reading through Australia's recent federal budget, as well as the budget of our local Shire Council, the idea of contracting our economic systems has not even begun to germinate in the minds of those who manage such institutions. This is why the storing of degrowth at a grassroots level the seeding of it in small and diverse narratives lived, not just abstractly conceived, is so important. Rather than wishfully wait for ministers and CEOs, treasurers and institutional economists to roll out fairer, regenerative and fluctuating economies that listen to the land's actual capacity, as a family we practice and celebrate the ethics and pragmatics of degrowth with every choice and action we make. Whether it's in what we wear, what we eat, how we move around, gather our basic materials, or how we heat our home, all our decisions are based upon divestment from monetized growth economics, while growing an indebtedness and dependency on what we call our local economies of belonging. Degrowth food is central to this economic transformation that is rooted in place. One eco-critical social commentator wrote of our family's response that not everyone will want to join this radical experiment, though most would agree, if our words aren't connected to deeds, then we're just fiddling while Rome burns. Because of the failures of government, the infinite growth on a finite planet imperatives of business, and the consumptive destructive values of modernity, such a radical experiment of simple, carbon-positive, relational and lived monetary degrowth may well become a new norm. Some will call this poverty and many will resist returning to a general state of frugalism. It is difficult to transition backwards from comfort, although the possibility for frugal hedonism is territory that will be further explored as degrowth unfolds in both planned and chaotic circumstances. Few now believe the myth of endless growth. Some will engage in the possibility of renewal and other forms of growth in this anticipated contraction. Some will fear and resent it, and in doing so give greater power to lawmakers and institutions. Cities may become more authoritarian and there is evidence of this trend already with new laws restricting protest. While basic services will decline in rural and remote areas, even though it will give greater scope for people to augment their local economic and cultural realities. To do the necessary work of reframing and of living economy and culture into degrowth in a state of mass panic will be more difficult than to respond now while there is relative affluence. Turning back is never a true going back, as there is always a taking forward with what we've learnt along the way. Like life itself, this path is not linear, and the future is never really subject to Christian calendars and clock time. But it will probably mean 
that at least one in every household will be growing and preserving food, and thus will be bringing the stories of land and non-human relating back to our kitchen tables. Food is the basis of belonging cultures of place. The word culture derives from the Latin cultura, which means to cultivate the soil. With degrowth of the formal economy, there will have to be much more growth in informal, non-monetary economies, and small-scale food production will be central to this change. As the Australian environmental lawyer and sustainability activist Michael Mobbs discovered, housing is important to sustainability, but food is central to addressing environmental species and climate crises. David Holmgren and Bill Mollison had this realisation back in the 1970s, triggered by the Limits to Growth report. Holmgren's most recent book, Retrosuburbia, is a pragmatic manual for a lived degrowth for people wishing to take personal responsibility, especially for their food, medicine and energy needs in a suburban context where the majority of the world's populations live. He breaks the book into three parts, the built, the biological and the behavioural. While we're featured throughout, it is in the behavioural section where much of our work is referenced. Some days it has felt like an impossible venture to live outside corporatized digi-industrial food and energy systems. The learning we have gone through over the past decade to put nourishing food on our plates and keep warm by our own labor has been extensive. Despairing after another crop failed, another year of Afajoa bushes not fruiting, another technical failure such as our bicycle trailer towing bracket breaking while hauling home 80 kilograms of firewood. Another row of tender leafy green seedlings devoured by snails, mice and slugs, coming home empty-handed after a futile mushroom forage, or hungry from checking an empty rabbit snare. Nothing to boast of in our fish bag, or trying to dry out our year's supply of acorn meal in a low oven, only f to forget about it and have this precious food end up as char. Despite such innumerable failings, and because of these hard-won learnings, we have been able to transition from 100% reliance upon the monetary economy to just 30% in the space of a decade, gifting and trading with around 80 other households and individuals in our town, and gradually reclaiming the skills of our land in cultured ancestors. By consciously putting the monetary economy into degrowth, we have been able to grow informal subsistence economies, community and home gardening, foraging and hunting, natural beekeeping and goat grazing on common land. In doing so, we have left behind our stressful money-earning days, a time when we believed we needed to work hard in the formal economy to afford some time to simply breathe, to go away, to not feel time pressured. Only when we began to untie ourselves from our monetary obligations did we realize that pursuing money had only incarcerated us further. The more we focused on money to find some level of respite from time poverty, the more in debt we became, and thus the more we needed to spend, consume, pollute, burn carbon, to fill the hole of our despair. We were not living according to our values, though we didn't know it then. What follows is a brief insight into what our highly conscious divorce from monetary growth has looked like over the past decade. Feeding the world. The provisioning, processing and storing of our food resources takes about three hours each day. Energy, retrieval, cutting and storing of wood equates to about one hour per day. Meg has a job two days a week outside the home servicing much of our monetary needs, while Patrick is seven days in the non-monetary home and community economies, occasionally receiving paid work as a writer, scholar and environmental consultant. Our two children have been taught our neo-peasant life skills, which we accumulated over the years, as have our friends, volunteers and community others. We have learnt from many people and continue to share this knowledge in non-monetary workshops and in less formal arrangements. We follow our individual interests and the seasons to determine what we do and make. 
Patrick volunteers his time at Feral and Free, a bush school he has set up to share with young people the arts and crafts of belonging to a forest ecology. Patrick is an active participant of the local bushfire mitigation group, co-facilitator of Goat Hand Cooperative and facilitates the running of three local community gardens. Meg is one of the conveners of Hepburn Relocalisation Network, which organises free monthly workshops in fermenting, herbal medicine, seed saving and natural beekeeping. We have mapped our town's food commons. We organise film nights, solstice and equinox dinners, guest speaking events and community group work to develop social permaculture. For the last several years, we've run non-monetary permaculture living courses where volunteers reside with us, exchanging their labour for learning, food and board so they can embody the life ways we've been developing over the past decade, reclaiming our domesticity from consumer culture. Planning. To begin the process, we wrote down all the items and associated outgoing costs we believe we could give up. Not all at once, but rather an initial checklist that we would start to delete from as we changed how we lived. In the early days, it was a range of things such as bin liners, journal subscriptions, tampons, toilet paper, haircuts, cafe meals, credit cards, plane travel, new clothes, new tools, monthly mobile phone plans, and so on. By going without these things, we found that we had more spare time as we didn't have to work as much to afford things. Conscious of our privilege, we began to refuse money work. We started this degrowth early on in our relationship, and it probably wouldn't have got rolling if only one of us was on board. Despite the long list of things we decided we could live without, nothing attended to our total dependency on money more dramatically than becoming car free. Owning, maintaining and fueling our two cars consumed a huge proportion of our annual expenditure. In the first few years, we were able to shed about 50% of our required income. Becoming carless was a large chunk of this percentage. Once we had naturalised going without items of modern life, often thought essential, we were able to plan the next stage. We found that if we attempted to give up too many things too soon, we became demoralised, and, similarly, if our transition from money was too slow, it felt like our process had stopped. We came to understand the process needed an aggregating step-by-step -step strategy, a slow distangling from hyper techno civility that eventually would flourish into full blown neo peasantry. Money. Reducing our hours of paid work had a twofold benefit. Firstly, we could be more selective about what paid work we wanted to do and do less of it, and secondly, we had more time at home to begin taking the steps to make our household economy flourish. Weaning ourselves off money was helped when Patrick received a scholarship to do his doctoral work, which centred on our household and community transition from reliance on hyper techno civility. Our household lived off this modest stipend for three and a half years. In this time, we didn't have to worry where money was coming from. We made the income go far, establishing open source community gardens, becoming better growers and preservers, cheese makers and scavengers, and learning about more than 100 species of edible flora, fauna and fungi that we could procure and process as valuable gifts to grow our degrowth transition. Building trusting relationships was also an essential part of this adaptation as was beginning to barter and gift for things we needed but didn't make ourselves. A competitive capitalist market, by its very nature, destroys social bonds by valuing narrow self-interest. It advances debt but degrades indebtedness. While it's true we still live with some money and participate a little in the monetary economy, mostly because we are repaying a mortgage, 
we do not share the monetary economy's values of hierarchical power and dominance and the disrespect it brings to life that is much more than human. We have scrutinised our financial institutions and have moved up debit accounts and Meg's meagre superannuation to community-based institutions that have divested from fossil fuels. What we can't provision for ourselves, we trade, swap, buy directly from local growers, farmers markets, food co-ops, and occasionally from our town's family-run grocery store. We don't drive cars, though we enjoy hitchhiking, sharing a ride offered if the carbon is already committed in the direction we are going, thus lowering the footprint of an otherwise solo traveller. We still directly give money to petroleum companies, though less than $100 per annum. We don't consume commercial alcohol, opting instead to drink our home-brewed and medicinal ciders, such as stinging nettle cider and root beers, including burdock, parsnip and dandelion, and mead made using the honey from our bees. Divestment from the growth alcohol industry is not just for monetary reasons, but for health too. Industrial strains of yeast and plant crops grown elsewhere, often requiring herbicides and the mass killing of wild birds to produce them, don't nourish us like our wild fermented brews made from what we grow or wild harvest. Nourishment also comes from being in the story of these gifts of the earth. Every week we buy 10 litres of unpasteurised cow's milk from a local farmer, from which we make butter cheese, yogurt and kefir. We don't buy meat and only eat animals that we have killed respectfully ourselves or have been killed by experienced friends. We breed chickens and ducks for eggs and meat. We fish in the local lake. We catch yabbies and snare rabbits and we breed meat goats which we keep on common land as part of a cooperative. After learning how to tell if an animal is unwell or diseased, we also butcher and eat roadkill, adding possum and kangaroo protein to our diet. All these behavioural changes and learnt skills have enabled us to divest from industrial food supply chains in a very direct and conscious way. Security We were both schooled to believe that security meant money. The myth of the capitalist matrix went something like this. If you study hard and get a good job, you will make more money, which will lead to a life of assurance, security and fulfilment. For a short while, we swallowed this myth. While our degrowth food, energy and medicinal economics sits upon stolen Aboriginal land, which we speak to later, and we're afforded some security to plant trees and a garden, we're not over-investing in this life way. We're also teaching ourselves, our children and innumerable others how to live on the road, how to live on tenacious weeds and feral plants, as we may well be climate refugees in the future. Adding a survivalist set of skills to permaculture keeps us open to radical changes and enables us to embrace uncertainty as it arises. Without money to count on, what does security mean? On one day, security means an abundant patch of parsley growing with a plethora of other herbs in the food forest part of the garden. On another day, security means a freezer full of gifted, home-killed and dressed roosters. On one day, security means the saving and storing of next season's pumpkin seeds. On another day, it means the physical labour and the quality of food we eat keeping us from reliance on the pharmaceutical industry. On yet another day, security means a fully stacked woodpile and food cellar before heading into the winter months. The definitions of security we had grown up with now seem narrow and naive and a deliberate way of keeping people held hostage to the growth capital matrix. Neo-peasant hedonism. As our skills grew and our mistakes lessened, we began to relish the home economy and ourselves as homemakers. We were inspired by people who were also living in non-monetary home economies, from pioneers of permaculture to skillful grandparents. 
rather than seeing them through modernity's eyes as irrelevant because they weren't participating in the workforce, they became our cohort. Each time we walked by a cafe with our full thermos and home-cooked biscuits or passed a new clothes shop on the way to the op shop, we felt a sense of great accomplishment, as though we'd overcome significant addictions of privilege. Credit cards became a thing of the past. A single debit card each replaced them. We only had what we had. We were no longer servicing our basic needs on a system of unaccountable, figurative wealth, with the exception of our mortgage. After several weeks volunteering at an anti-coal seam gas blockade, we started to plan how we could turn off the gas to our home. We replaced our gas heating, cooking and hot water system with a glass-doored wood-fired oven, which we now use for nine appliances – heater, oven, toaster, clothes dryer, hot water service, kettle, dehydrator, stove top and, as we also like to add, our television too. It took two years to pay for and fully install the wood-fired system. With wood and kindling collected from the nearby forest in wheelbarrows as part of sensitive fuel and weed reduction work we do with our neighbours, or from the local tip using bike trailers, we are now responsible for a large chunk of our energy resources supplemented by our small one kilowatt solar powered electricity system. As a result, we are more in relationship with our local biosphere and more observing and honouring of the sun. While keeping fallen wood on the ground for habitat and soil production is important, there is an oversupply of such material which poses a fire threat. We also keep fit collecting these resources and have the satisfaction of knowing that what we use to warm ourselves and cook our meals has not been mined and transported, but is a renewable resource that we can contribute to replenishing through our community forestry practices. Some might refer to our apparent neo-peasant hedonism as libertine. The reality is we believe in law that protects local communities, human and more than human, and we work to re-establish such relationships to land. Access to land When we first hooked up as a couple, we were living in separate rentals. Fairly quickly we moved in together and began sharing everything. By our mid to late thirties, we'd accumulated enough savings for a deposit on a quarter acre block in a town that was, back then, only mildly affected by the property bubble. We put a small relocatable house on it and even though the monthly mortgage repayments worked out to be the same as our previous rental costs, at first they were a struggle to cover. Only now we could plant tree crops, grow vegetables, keep bees and poultry with the security of knowing we are not going to be given six weeks notice to vacate. As a result of increasingly living a time-rich, cash-poor economy, we found we had time to help establish and facilitate three community gardens in the town, serving, beyond our own provisioning, the possibility of growing organic food on public land that isn't under economic lock and key. Despite our mistrust of and radical decoupling from social media dependency, we have established the near self-maintaining Landshare Central Victoria Facebook group to connect those who have surplus access to land with those who would like access to land. The group's successes, including people moving into granny flats, studios and moving their mobile tiny houses onto land where they can grow food. Some arrangements are based on money or partial money and some purely on a work or produce exchange. Over the last 10 years, we have hosted hundreds of visitors coming on house and garden tours or as volunteers to live and labour with us, all to experience the possibility of a neo-peasant lifeway. We currently have two doctoral students from Europe living with us for six months. They are collecting and analysing white ethnographies involving permaculture transitions. With access to land, 
we have been able to not only establish post-capital food, energy and medicine, but also a self-appointed university based upon non-monetary exchange. Volunteers, including visiting scholars, embody neo-peasantry. They get to live its possibilities. From reclaimed materials, we have built two small dwellings to house such guests. If the housing bubble bursts, as predicted, and climate change continues to savage the formal economy, these dwellings will become homes for people to come and live permanently, while they contribute to strengthening the home and community economies. Land Sovereignty Our land access sits on the back of the legal historical fiction Terra Nullius, which property law is founded upon in Australia. We could choose to ignore this legal and historical fabrication defended by the Australian Army and State Police Forces and pretend that this system was decided outside our control many generations earlier. However, be we mortgage holders, renters or living on so-called public land as squatters or homeless subjects of competitive capitalism, as non-Indigenous Australians we must accept this land has been stolen and land titles fabricated. This situation in Australia is an example of the neo-colonialism that degrowth advocates acknowledge and seriously aim to address. The annual Terra Nullius breakfast we established several years ago, which takes place outside the local town hall on what is officially called Australia Day on 26th of January, is what we call white fella business. This breakfast is our fessing up to historical wrongs and keeping on the table the movement to dissolve private property and properly address Indigenous sovereignty. While we have found that exiting the matrix of food, energy and medicine growth economies is possible in a relatively short focused period of time, the bigger picture project of the capitalisation of never ceded land will take decades. To dismantle capital growth ideology starts with what is possible, establishing partial post-growth economies and reclaiming skills our ancestors held. Skilling up and changing behaviours. With more time on our hands, we began to realise that there were large gaps in our knowledge and skills bank. If we wanted to move further away from the monetary economy, then we needed to dedicate ourselves to learning new skills. We joined workshops, read widely, watched online tutorials and learned from friends and volunteers. Much of this learning came from a commons of information or we exchanged something for workshops or assisted a class in exchange for learning. We began to see that in order to recreate food, medicine and energy economies post-growth, we needed to learn about every edible weed and feral species in our walked-for locosphere. We needed to learn about preserving and how fermentation can delay our food's decay and in doing so improve its nutrition. We needed to learn about the soil's communities and what they require to produce an abundance of vegetables. We needed to learn how to make snares, slingshots and longbows for low-tech retrieval of feral animals otherwise poisoned by the state. We needed to learn about tree care, what to prune, what to leave, how to treat pests without industrial and monetized products and the cycles of nutrient returns needed for the fruits to keep flowing. We needed to learn how to safely compost our own human waste, recognising that we are the largest mammals on our quarter acre block and therefore our humanure is a form of gold for the soil communities growing our food. Moreover, recognising that globally we are at post-peak phosphate rock and that safely processed humanure can replace superphosphate. We needed to learn about our local waste food streams and how to glean that waste respectfully. We knocked on people's doors to ask whether we could pick up fallen fruit lying under their trees that we'd notice by having the time to observe and being on foot. 
we provided 25 litre buckets to cafes for their scraps that we could collect every few days to compost into soil. We needed to learn how to critically look for building and fuel materials at the council tip site, how to seek quality warm clothes and tools from op shops, markets and garage sales, and most importantly, we needed to learn how to make rituals of returns to the garden and forest communities that we were becoming bonded to and nourished by. Relationships Understanding the importance of relationships throughout our transition has been essential. Relationships with soil communities, with individual trees, with messenger birds, with clouds, with dog kin, goats, bees, microbes, with one another and with ourselves. Relating in the monetary economy is straightforward. If you'd like a bottle of cider, then you hand over money and it is handed to you in exchange. In a non-monetary economy, it is more involved and far more nuanced. We need to give up our jobs, so we are not always pressed for time. We need to walk through our neighbourhood commons. We need to pay attention. We need to be able to recognise what an apple tree looks like and the cankers that can be cut out to aid its health. We need to watch for when the fruit is ripe. We need to be quick to beat the birds from taking it all, but not so quick to retard ripening. We need to have the means to carry the fruit home. We need to be fit enough in our bodies to shoulder or pedal the haul. We need to have a way to extract the juice from the fruit. We need to have a means to discard the pulp in a non-polluting way. We need a vessel in which to ferment the juice. We need the know-how to turn the juice into cider through processes of wild fermentation. We need to know what to do with all the vinegar when our process fails, or we intentionally allow for the vinegar molecules to overcome the cider yeasts. We need to know how to give value to our learnings, so when a friend comes over with a loaf of bread, she is not disappointed when we give her a bottle of peach pip vinegar or wild apple cider in return. Money in the bank is not security for us, nor are stacked supermarket shelves or jobs to pay for petrol, depreciation, wear and tear, insurance, petrol, traffic infringement fines, parking and the servicing of cars. Instead we are framed within a wheel of ecological culture. What makes us feel secure is our bicycle maintenance knowledge, a full cellar of preserves ferments and stored fresh produce, a diverse bank of saved seeds, a full wood stack and perhaps most importantly our ability to relate, care for and rely on a diverse range of people in our region made up of family, friends and community allies. Our welfare derives from the solidarity and reciprocity of this community as well as deepening our ways of relating with more than humans such as dogs, goats, messenger birds and trees. We need to know how to listen to each tree's will and not impose ourselves upon it. This is a new language for us. Belonging Born within a white fellow nation state cultural context of being there rather than belonging here, the most serious question for us looks something like this. How can we reclaim a belonging and honouring of the living of the world when the dismantling of such cosmology spans so many centuries and we stand upon non-ceded Aboriginal land? Our reply in progress has two parts. The first is that the great lie of terra nullius is a long-term project of societal admission. The second is that our food, medicine and energy resources in their industrial capital forms can be radically composted in the short term by any willing household and community group, providing there is some form of access to land. All migrants, including white descendants of colonists and their convict subjects, want to make home. There seems to be a natural human will or tendency to fall in love with a place, 
for that place to belong to you as you belong to it. To grow fond of a home place, to listen deeply to it, to belong vulnerably held within its shape-shifting and giving entities is to suggest an economy predicated on a flow of gifts where the food produced and gathered comes wrapped in story and origin. Did the sun grow this food? Did the rain? Did the soil? Did the plant? Did we? Who are all these actors that make our lives possible? For our form of neo-peasantry, we seek to be in relationship with a walked-for world, a belonging to life's sympoetic nourishment as eaters and eventually as food. These red berries I pull from this small tree Come primitive thorns that stick in to me Pricking the continuous line of spirit That the old people began when making fruit leather Fermented by the sun To survive for winter From a place of Simple narration An autumn recipe Requiring just fruit Water and solar radiation Ah. Uh. 